So, Father, we thank you for today's word. We thank you that you'll speak to us by your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, that we would have a fresh and important understanding of everything you're going to say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, last week was pretty hectic. Um, it may have exceeded your capacity to uh, write down everything understand everything I talked about, so I encourage you to go and watch on our YouTube channel and to uh, look up Saving Grace Church on YouTube. It's the one with the red cross, you can't miss it, and re-watch last week so that you can just kind of um, get it in your head what I was talking about because there were like 30 plus scriptures we went through in one hour, so it was very, very hectic. And uh, I, I just feel that that would be a good one for you to sit back and rewatch, and and to lead up to today, part four of the Holy. The last three weeks, missed any of the last three weeks. I do suggest you go and catch them on YouTube, and so that you can be up to date because this is such an important topic, such an important understanding of the Holy Spirit. And just to recap, we examined two prophetic words in the Old Testament last week. The first one was in Ezekiel 36, so let's read that word. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And so what we examined last week was that was the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is given to us that we are baptized with when we become a new believer. But then we looked at a prophecy in Joel. And uh, this is Joel 2, 28 to 29. And afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so that prophetic word was talking about the empowering of the Holy Spirit, it was talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, similar to what happened in Acts 2, when they were all gathered together in the upper room and the Holy Spirit was poured out on them and they spoke in other tongues. And I, I won't go over all of those things that we discussed last week. You can catch them in part three on YouTube. But there is a third work of the Holy Spirit that I promised to speak about this week. And it is as important as the first two that we spoke about. And it's very good that we can get a better understanding of this. And we're going to begin in John 7, 37 to 39. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So it's very important to have an understanding of what feast Jesus was talking at, so that you can understand the picture that Jesus was illustrating here. This was the Feast of the Tabernacles. It's very important to have this understanding because you will start to see why Jesus was talking about rivers of living water when you understand what they did at the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was a festival rich in symbolism, a time of remembering how God had the wilderness and into his promised land. So remember, the people of Israel, they broke out of Egypt, they went through the wilderness, and after 40 years, they went into the promised land. Well, guess what? In the wilderness, you need water, right? You need water. And on each of the seven days of the feast, a priest drew water from the pool of Siloam in a golden flagon, a golden jug. And he brought it in a procession to the temple and they, they had trumpets that would blow joyful music as they brought this golden jar, this golden flagon of water to the temple. And they would pour it into a bowl 
this, uh, and this bowl was beside the altar and a tube or like a pipe would take that water from the bowl to the base of the altar. And this would be a reminder to the people that God was their provider, not only in the wilderness, but in the rains that came for their harvest. And the Feast of the Tabernacles, part of this feast was a celebration of God's provision of rain and water for the people. Isn't that interesting? This is so good that you have this understanding so you understand why Jesus is using an illustration of rivers of living water. It was a symbolic thanksgiving to God. And Isaiah 12.3 is a verse that is used at this festival. And what is that verse? We read about it. With joy, everyone say, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And they were prophetically speaking about drawing from the wells of salvation this joy. It was the verse that was given for this particular festival. And they were talking about the water that God gave in the wilderness. They were talking about the rains that came for their crops. But Jesus was going to say, you have a real need for physical water, but you have a greater need for a spiritual water, a salvation that is going to come when you drink of me. And John clearly defines it in case you were confused says, it will be the Holy Spirit in you that will be that river. Not only a river, but rivers of living water will flow from you. Now, if you know anything about a river, it has a source. And the river's source is usually high up in a mountain or in the hills and the river flows, you know, it's maybe a little creek and it gets bigger and bigger and it becomes often a mighty river. And what we see here in the Swan River, you know, is the result of tributaries of water flowing in to the Swan and becoming bigger and bigger as more creeks and rivers flow into that river. But if we didn't have source, the Swan River would dry up. You know, the, the rivers would dry up if there was no source of water flowing to create that water. Have you ever been into Guildford and seen the Swan River really high after a lot of rain? Like it can even flood the grapevines. Remember we had that flood just, I think it was a year or two back, and it flooded all of the, the, the flood valley there in, in, in Guildford. The, the grapevines were literally underwater. But then, guess what happened? The water went down, right? It's not flooding grapevines right now why is that because the flood of rain is not coming you know we're coming into spring and summer and so the level of the river has gone down and so Jesus was saying here that there is a source that you need for this river to flow out of you and that source is found in me he talks about it again vine and that you know, we are connected. We are branches connected into the vine. Guess what? Sap. Sap continually flows through the vine. It, it draws water up in, from the ground, creates sap, which flows into the fruit and creates fruit. If you are cut off from that source, you're dead. And so this continual illustration that Jesus is giving is that we need to continue to be filled from the source. To have these rivers of living water pouring out of us means that we have a source that we're always drawing from. Or our river will go down. Just like the Swan River goes down when there's less rain and goes up when there's more rain. Now, Jesus said this on the eighth and last day of the feast. Now, what happened on the eighth day was no water was brought from the pool of Siloam was only brought for the first seven days. And on the eighth day, no water was brought from the pool. And so Jesus gets up on this day when there is no water. And he says, I am the one who you are going to come and drink from and living waters will come out of you. So when there was no physical water, Jesus was saying, I am the supply that you need. Let's go to Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. This word, be filled, has a particular Greek tense, which means 
uh, to be filled, to, to always being filled, okay? To continually be filled. The Greek tense for this word is a continual process of filling. So it's not just saying be filled once, but it's saying continually be filled. That's what the Greek tense of this verse is saying. Being filled. Not be filled once only, but being filled. A continual process. The river's source in us should not dry up. The Swan River should not go down so low. You know, the, the Holy Spirit in us needs to be rivers of living water flowing out of us. As it flows out of us, we need to keep being filled so that we can continue to flow. And there are two ways the continual filling of the Holy Spirit is depicted in the New Testament, and in particular, the book of Acts. And I'm going to describe to you the two ways the continual filling of the Holy Spirit is important in our life. So I hope you're writing notes today, guys. I hope you're writing this down because this is so good for you to understand this. The first is when we have a time of need. And I'm going to give you three specific examples of a time of need when the disciples or the people of God needed the Holy Spirit to fill them. And the first is found in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Peter has been speaking to the crowd and... um, The priests, in verse 1, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So there's powerful preaching going on. The word of God is coming and people are getting saved. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. And so for Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. The who's who of the the, the priesthood was there. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Now remember Peter, remember Peter, what did Peter do the night Jesus went to the cross? He denied Jesus, right? Remember the servant girl said to him, you were with him. And he goes, no, I wasn't. In fact, the Bible says that Peter called down curses. You know, he swore and said, I do not know him. Three times he denied Christ. And and here's Peter being challenged by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we have been called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, but that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, if you remember back to what we taught in the last few weeks, the Holy Spirit's role is to glorify Jesus. Okay? And it said there that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, when it says that they were filled, it literally means they were filled right then when they had to speak. Peter stood up and he was filled right then by the Holy Spirit. Now, Peter had been filled in the the upper room. You know, he'd been baptized there, but it literally means he was filled right then and he stood up and he spoke with boldness and they looked at him as an unschooled fisherman, you know, probably, you know, in in modern day terms, he would have maybe had the tattoos on his arms and, you know, no no schooling or whatever, just a simple person. And he spoke with boldness and courage to the very elite of the day. And talked about Christ with no fear. And they said, he's been with Jesus because the Holy Spirit's role is to glorify Jesus. So what did they say? Oh, 
they've got the Holy Spirit. No, he's been with Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit's job is not to talk about himself. The Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus. And so here is the Holy Spirit in action in Peter glorifying Jesus. And so they are drawn to the way these people are speaking. And they were actually given the words by the Spirit at that time to speak. And let's read this in Matthew 10. Jesus promises this. Matthew 10, 17 to 20. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So at that time, you will be filled with the Spirit, and He will speak through you, and He will speak the words that God has for you to speak. And that's exactly what happened here in Acts chapter 4. They were filled with the Spirit, they spoke boldly, and they glorified Jesus Christ. Acts 13, 4 to 12. This is on the island of Cyprus. So verse 4. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, so this is a Roman, okay, he's not a Jew, he's a Roman, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, this is this guy Bar Jesus, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, listen to this, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So this um, thing where it says there in verse 9, then Paul, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, is that same Greek tense that he was filled at that moment with the Holy Spirit to oppose this demonic man, this demonic force that was opposing him and the Word of God. And so in that moment, the Holy Spirit comes upon Paul, fills him with power to speak and to do a miracle that this guy will not even see anymore so that the proconsul will be shown the power of God. And what did Paul say? That the power will be there to confirm the word. And that's exactly what happened. He was filled with the spirit at that moment and he was able to combat the opposition. And in Acts 4, again, near the end of Acts 4, verses 23 to 31. So after Peter and John speak... Uh, to the, the Sanhedrin that we talked about, they, they get released and uh, they get let out. And in verse 23 of chapter 4, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, Our father David, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And the people in the shopping center want to kick us out of the shopping center, etc., etc. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. 
After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So here it is again. It's happening again. You know, Peter and John were in the upper room. Peter and John were there, you know, in the Sanhedrin. And here with the believers being filled again. Why? To be empowered to speak the word with great boldness. And then we see what happens to the believers. You can read about it straight away after that heart. They start selling everything they own and they come and bring it to the church. You know, there's nothing holding them back. They're sold out to the Lord because they're filled with the Spirit and they don't care anything about except glorifying Jesus with their life. And so here we see three examples, three examples of the Holy Spirit being filling these people because they had a time of need. And I want to tell you about my experience, which I've shared with you before. When I was in Burundi and I was called to the presidential palace to have dinner with the president and with his uh, cabinet, and we were there with the team, and I was asked uh, when I was on my way to the toilet uh, to speak in front of the president. It's a weird kind of request when you're going somewhere to do something and then you get asked to speak to the president. And I said, okay, thinking that I would have time to prepare. As soon as I sat down, they came to me and said, okay, you can get up and speak now. (laughs) This is not, you know, some, you know, people that you just meet on the street. This is the rulers and leaders of a whole nation. And you know what? The Holy Spirit just gave me the words. Right then at that moment, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and he gave me the words to speak. And this is what I'm saying. I had time of need. I had nothing prepared. I had no you know, understanding of what I was going to say. But at that moment, in front of the kings and rulers of that nation, the Holy Spirit filled me with power and I spoke his word with boldness and I saw a work of God in that night. And it is just so wonderful to see this actually happen in your life, to see scripture literally happening in your life. It's so awesome. At the time when we had a need, we were in Ethiopia and we had traveled me and one other guy, all the way to Ethiopia to speak to a great crusade in Ethiopia. And we got to that crusade and we, were, we just entered into the, the, it was an open area. There were probably five or 6,000 people there. And the guy at the front was preaching against us. And the translator said to us, he's saying that these Westerners, these white people will never preach on this platform. And we're going, hang on, we, we just come all the way from Australia to preach on this platform and he's saying that there's no way this will happen. And so I said to the guys, you need to go back and pray and I'm going to come and I'm going to sit at the front and I'm going to see what God tells me to do. And so they went home to pray. I went and sat at the front of the platform uh, where they... And uh, I was just there watching them speak, what they were doing and... um, then the Holy Spirit started to speak to me. And it was during the choir singing and dancing on the platform. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Chris, I want you to get up there and dance with the choir on the platform. And my response was, white men can't dance. (laughs) I don't know if you saw that film, White Men Can't Jump, but... White men can't dance. These guys are experts. You know, they've got the rhythm. It's Africa. (laughs) I don't have the rhythm. You know, I'm this white guy. You know, I don't don't have that rhythm. But the Holy Spirit, Chris, get up and dance. And so I got up on the platform and I just started dancing with the choir. The Holy Spirit is not telling me to do that right now. (laughs) Anyway, the people went crazy. 5,000 people got up and started dancing. It was just amazing. We were all dancing and no one was looking at me anymore because everyone was just dancing and it was awesome because, you know, I wasn't really doing the two-step right, but they they, they were dancing. And they were so excited. And, and I, I, went, um, I went back um, out after the, 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 the meeting and the guy came to me who was leading the whole thing. And he said, 
um, Pastor Chris, we need to have a meeting to talk about what's going on here and why you're not to preach. And I said, yeah, that's right. We need to have that meeting. And so the next morning, um, we, we go home. Uh, sorry, the next morning we come to this meeting and it's in this dark room and we're there with all these pastors and everything and the leaders of this denomination. And I'm sitting there with my friend and the translator and they're all arguing. Because we, we had sponsored this crusade but the people running the crusade had told all the people, we need your money to pay for the crusade. And when the advertisements were put up for the crusade, it said sponsored by our church, you know, our church in Australia. And so the people came and said, you said you needed our money. And it's sponsored by this Australian church and you asked for our money. And so they, they got angry at the leaders, like they're taking their money. And so they had to deny us the right to preach so that they could show that it wasn't us, you know, so that the people wouldn't be angry. And so this guy who'd spoken to me, he said, if any of you let them preach, you'll be sacked, lose your job. And so that's why they weren't going to let us preach. And so they're all arguing and fighting about this. And I'm trying to ask my translator what's going on, but she's arguing. You know, they're all arguing. And so my friend and I just start praying in tongues. And we're literally just sitting there because we don't know what's going on. And then the Holy Spirit just came down in that room. They began to weep. They began to, tears were welled up in their eyes and they were weeping and crying and they began to apologize and ask forgiveness from each other and from us. And that day we got up and we preached in that place and the place went crazy. And, you know, when we went back, came back in the afternoon, they were still there and they were still dancing and into the night, I don't know, it was close to midnight, they were still dancing and they were set free in that place. And it was the powerful movement of the Holy Spirit. And when I was preaching on that platform, come on, when I was preaching on that platform, a lady was sitting in the, in the, the audience, you know, thousands of people, and her, her bones were literally all twisted up. And I began to speak on a passage in Ezekiel about the Valley of Dry Bones. And as I began to preach on that passage, I didn't see this happening. She came and told me afterwards. As I began to preach on that passage, her bones literally up and her body became as new and she came to me afterwards she said pastor chris i just have to tell you this is what happened she testified to what happened during the preaching you see satan wanted to keep these people bound but the holy spirit wanted to set them free and that's what happened and because of that we came back many times to ethiopia and we see thousands and thousands of people saved i've seen more than 12, 15,000 people saved in Ethiopia in the three trips that I've been there. And it's been the work of God's Holy Spirit, just an outpouring of His Spirit. And right at that moment, when they were praying back in the room and the Holy Spirit told me to dance, that's when they had the breakthrough. They stopped praying because God already told them, that's it, the breakthrough happened when I got up and danced. And I was literally filled with the Spirit then because there was no way I was going to dance unless the Holy Spirit was me and empowering me to do that to make a fool of myself you know rose just got up and she ran around this auditorium you know what because she doesn't care what people think she doesn't care what people think because she just wants to obey the holy spirit and that's what happened on that platform i wanted to obey the holy spirit so i got up and i danced and the power of the holy spirit was released on that place i've got some i just wanted to illustrate to you that this is real that it's actually happened not just some historical book that you read, that what is in here can be yours. What he'll do for them, what he did for me, he'll do for you. God doesn't think I'm better than you or that they were better than us. God loves us all equally. He wants to fill us all equally. He wants to empower us. The only problem is our end. Are we willing? Are we wanting it? Are we desiring it? Are we really willing to open up our heart and let God do he wants are we willing to get up and dance are we willing to run around a building are we willing to do whatever he tells us to do and in a willing vessel the holy spirit will move like that so that is the first um, way the holy spirit comes in a time of need he fills us with his power and with words to speak when we need it the second way is a continuing experience. And this is just as important as the first. And we find this outline in Ephesians 5, 15 onwards. So I'm going to go through this verse by verse, 
and outline it for you because it's really important to understand this passage. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, so verse 15 says that be very careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise and um, this the, the Greek for this is actually saying that you need to be serious about your life okay don't live as the unwise but as the wise be serious about your life that's what Paul is saying here you need to be serious about your life and and this word unwise is actually the Greek word for unintelligent do not be unintelligent. Do not be unwise. And so he is um, contrasting this and saying, really, quit your foolish behavior and stop acting as unintelligent people and be like the cultured and intelligent believers I know that you can be. So he's kind of, you know, slapping them and giving them a pat on the back at the same time, saying, stop being fools, stop this idiotic behavior you're doing. In fact, you can be someone that God's called you to be. And he pats them on the back. You know, the cultured and intelligent believers I'm calling you to be. And I, I want you to understand something about Ephesus and the church in Ephesus. And let's go to Revelation chapter 2. I apologize, um, Glenn, I didn't give you this, this passage. Revelation 2, um, verse 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right. There are, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. So the church in Ephesus had this works ability to persevere, to, to, to do what was right, but they had lost their first love. They had gone back to loving the things of this world. Yes, they were persevering in time of trial, but they were filled with wine, not filled with the Spirit. And so Paul is encouraging them in Ephesians that, guys, you need to not be drunk on the Spirit, not to live, sorry, drunk on wine, not to live as fools, but to live as intelligent and cultured people that I know you can be. And so um, in verse 16, he says, let me go back to Ephesians, verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. This um, phrase, making the most of every opportunity, actually refers to redeeming the time. And the word redeem means to buy back the time. And there's a very, very precious promise in uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And I just want to read that promise to you now. It is very, very precious. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. The great locust and the young locust, the other locust and the locust swarm. So this is God's promise that he is going to repay the years that the locust ate. Now, how did he do that? He did it through Christ on the cross. That was the salvation that he brought, the ultimate fulfillment of this prophetic. Now, what do locusts do? Locusts are a swarm of animals that can consist of insects of billions. 
of locusts. In fact, there are 80 million locusts per square kilometer in a swarm of locusts. A swarm of locusts can grow to become 300 square kilometers. So in each of those square kilometers, there is 80 million locusts. So a swarm of 300 square kilometers is billions of locusts. And they consume 200 million kilograms of food in one day. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the locusts are sent by the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy. And sometimes we fill our life with stuff that steals, kills, and destroys and takes our time. Sometimes we make mistakes and we make wrong decisions and we, we waste our time. But God is saying here through Paul that you can redeem the time, amen? That he is even promising in, in, in the book of Joel that God will redeem what the locusts have stolen. This is the promise of God and the Holy Spirit in us redeems the time. You can waste years of your life and in one moment the Holy Spirit can come into you, fill you and redeem your time, redeem the moment, redeem everything that was broken and ruined in your life and you become someone who you weren't a day before because the Holy Spirit is coming. It's called the power of God redeeming your life, redeeming your time, redeeming your mistakes, redeeming what the locust has stolen in your life life verse 17 therefore do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is so this word foolish means brainless and often the lost opportunities we have had is because we were brainless we were foolish we did stuff that was wrong we made mistakes we, we wrecked our time because we just made stupid mistakes. And I don't think I'm on my own to say that I've wasted my time at different times in my life. Who here has wasted their time at different times in their life? Yep. So about half of us are honest. <laughs> and they were the ones putting up their hands. Now, he's saying here that um, therefore, do not be foolish, so do not waste your time, but understand what the Lord's will is. So this, this passage, understand, that word understand means a coming together of the pieces. If you imagine a jigsaw puzzle, and if you hold up one piece of that puzzle, you have no idea what the puzzle looks like, right? It could be anything. But when all those pieces are placed down, you see what the picture looks like. And that picture is the will of God. And our life is this jigsaw puzzle and we think, I can't understand what the will of God is because you're looking at one piece. You need the Holy Spirit to show you all the pieces and how they fit together. And that's why when you look at the foolish things you've done or the mistakes you've made, and you go, man, my life is a blow. It just, there's no way it can work because you're looking at one piece. But he's saying, don't be foolish, but understand. Look at all the pieces of what God has for you, His will for you, and bring them all together like a puzzle. Now, have you ever got a puzzle and built it in one minute? It takes time, right? And sometimes you're going, God, this has taken so long. Well, God is putting the pieces in place in your life, and He's building that jigsaw puzzle in your life, and you're actually starting to see more and more of the pieces as you submit more and more to His Spirit. Isn't this a beautiful picture of how God wants to work in our life? And how the broken things, so maybe the, the black pieces in the puzzle, you know, the dark pieces in the puzzle, the, the things that went wrong in our life bring contrast to the color and light things in our life. Amen? That's what God does with the puzzles of our life. He brings contrast and beauty with the dark and the light. But this will of God is what he wants to reveal to us. And in verse 18, he says... Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, filled with the Spirit. So, <laughs> you know, this, this word drunk and being, you know, and debauchery means you're a drunkard. You know, you're drinking all the time. You, you're drunk. And, 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 and what Paul is saying here, and it's important to understand this, is that we are all needy. Okay, we are all needy. And do you notice that when you have time that you tend to fill it with something? 
you feel the need to fill your time with something, or if you're not in a relationship and you feel the need to fill your life with a relationship, well, who's felt like that? Who was alone and felt the need to fill their life with a relationship? Okay, I'm sure there's more than you who felt like that, but I felt like that. And often we feel that desire with bad stuff. And one of the things we can do is fill it with alcohol. Another thing is drugs or porn or whatever. We fill our life with things that we shouldn't fill it with because we have a need to be filled. We have a need because God placed in us a desire to have something. And that something is Him. It's His Holy Spirit and it is inside you. And it's such a powerful force that you know that you need to be filled. And so you look for everything that you can fill your life with, but there is only one thing you're supposed to be filled with, and it's the Holy Spirit. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, you're going to fill your life with other stuff. And that's why even Christians can have demonic forces opposing them and even have demonic forces, you know, working inside them. Why? Because there is areas of their life that are not filled with God's Spirit. There are areas of life that are not submitted to God's Spirit. And I don't have time to teach on this today, but I want to tell you that I've observed it. I've seen it myself. And people who have not allowed the Holy Spirit to fill them and totally and utterly have allowed other areas of their life to be controlled. That's why you get Christians who are addicted to porn. You get Christians who are addicted. That's demonic. It is demonic. You get Christians who are addicted to alcohol. It's demonic. They are filling themselves with something because they need to be filled. And they haven't filled themselves with the Holy Spirit. They've filled themselves with other things. And this, remember what I said about the river. It's a continual filling. Come on. It's a continual filling. The river needs to grow in our life. So what? It becomes rivers. Not just a river, but rivers of living water that flow out from us. And this is the power of understanding. When you know why you're so addicted to something, when you understand why you can't seem to but because inside of you is a desire to be filled. And so you're trying to fill it and it's a burning compassion and uh, sorry, compulsion in you to be filled. And so you fill it with stuff, but it's the wrong stuff. And so Paul is saying, don't get drunk on that wine. Don't fill your life with the wrong stuff. Be filled with the Spirit. A continual filling. Not one-time experience, but a continual filling a source that is increasing the supply in your life so that those rivers become bigger and bigger in your life. We need to be intentional about this. You are intentional when you want to get a drink. You're intentional when you want to get a smoke. You're intentional about taking drugs. You're intentional about looking at stuff you shouldn't look like at your computer. You're intentional about it and you need to be intentional about the Holy Spirit. You're intentional every time you pull this thing out and get on it and waste your time on it. You're being intentional. We need to be intentional about the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Philippians 1, 19 to 20. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Hear you, hear Paul's cry. What is his intention? That whether he's tortured, whether he's dead, whether he's alive, he wants Christ to be exalted in him. What does that word exalt mean? It means to be um, multiplied, amplified, boosted in your life. He wanted Christ to be boosted and amplified in his life. Why? Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. It brings glory to Jesus. And so when we're being filled with the Spirit of God, we want to bring glory to Jesus. We want our life to amplify like my voice is being amplified by these speakers. Come on, I, I can yell at you, but these speakers amplify my voice so that I don't have to yell, even though sometimes I get excited and I do raise my voice because I'm passionate about what the Lord is putting in my heart, but they amplify our voice and our life is supposed to be amplifying Jesus. And that's the purpose of the Spirit's work in our life. And so we need to be intentional and in choosing to amplify Christ in our life through the Spirit's work. So um, those are the two ways that the Spirit works in us after we are initially 
receive Jesus and we're baptised in the Spirit, we actually need to be continually filled. And those are in times of need and a continual experience that brings the waters out of us, the rivers out of us, the source. And I'm going to finish by talking about what it looks like when you are continually being filled with the Spirit. And um, Paul actually describes this in verse 19 onwards. Because we need to understand, am I filled with the Spirit? Is that feeling going on in my life or is it not? We need to identify this, right? Because it, it's, it, Paul is telling us, be filled with the Spirit. So we need to understand what it looks like. So verse 19, he begins to talk about what it looks like. Instead, be filled with the Spirit is the last bit in 18. And then he says, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God and the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on and he talks about wives and husbands and the role of the wife and the husband. Then he talks about children and the role of the children. Then he talks about fathers and their role towards their children. And then he talks about slaves and masters. And he's talking about all of the relationships that we have. Come on. And those relationships we have should look like this. And if they do not look like this, we need to go back and be filled again with them. We need to say, God, fill me afresh today because my relationships do not look like this. My, my attitude does not look like this. And so obviously I need that infilling. I need to continue to draw from your source. And so let's break down in verse 19. Um, there, uh, in verse 19, uh, speaking to one another with psalms. This uh, word psalms means that our hearts are filled with praise. So we speak to one another, the heart filled with praise. Think about how you speak to other people. Is there an overflowing praise coming out of your mouth? That's the first indicator of whether or not we need to be filled with God's Spirit. Hymns, these are holy songs that we sing. Do you like to sing to God? Do you like to listen to worship? Do you like God's presence to fill your house? Or do you fill it with other stuff? Songs in the Spirit. What does this literally mean, singing in the Spirit? What is that, singing in tongues? It's literally singing in the Spirit. And God will enable you to sing in tongues. And sometimes you will see the worship team singing in tongues. Sometimes you will hear me singing in tongues. Praise God, it's the Holy Spirit taking over so you don't run out when I start singing in tongues. But singing in the Spirit. Here we are told to sing in the Spirit. It's something that God is encouraging us to do. The next is submitting, sorry, um, always giving thanks. Let's read that. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Sorry, I missed that. This make music is talking about making a melody and the actual Greek for that is plucking the strings of an instrument, like plucking the strings of a harp. And, and that the instrument that Paul is talking about that we need to pluck the strings of to make music to the Lord is the instrument of our heart. And so this literally is saying, making music from your heart to the Lord is plucking the string of the instrument of your heart to make a joyful music to the Lord. That's what he's referring to. So the instrument is your heart. So what plays in your heart? What are the strings that are plucked in your heart? What is the, the words that come out when you speak from your heart? Out of the mouth, the heart speaks. So what is coming out of our mouth? And so then he says in verse... Uh, 20, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, um, our lives are filled with ingratitude. We're so often ungrateful and unthankful. But here we are told to always give thanks. And so one of the key indicators of whether God's Spirit is filling us and becoming a river of living waters, living rivers coming out of us, is our thanksgiving. You know, a key indicator is what we're talking. Are we complaining? Are we criticizing? Are we running other people down? Then we need a fresh feeling of the Lord because guess what? Jesus did not come to condemn the world but to save the world. 
And there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And God is the pruner. You are not the pruner. God is the gardener. It's his job to prune. It's his job to prune in his garden, not your job. Your job is to give thanks in all circumstances. And we need to understand this. When the Spirit fills you, you're going to be filled with thanksgiving. Because no one goes up to someone and glorifies Jesus by running another person down. And the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus. But when you come and encourage someone and lift them up, what are you doing? You're glorifying Jesus in that person. You're lifting them up. You're revealing the Holy Spirit's work in your heart. And so we should not be a people who are complaining and being negative and putting up. And we should be a people of thanksgiving. And so this is a key indicator of whether we need to come to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you need to fill me more and more because I'm just complaining here. I've got a negative attitude and I need you to come and fill me in this place because I need to be thankful. So look at the way you talk, the way you think. You know, sometimes maybe you're just thinking it, you're not speaking it, but you know what's in your mind. It's negative and critical and, you know, coming down on others. You need to say, Holy Spirit, fill me afresh. I need to drink from the source because I need to flow with living water. You know what negative words are? They're death. They're death. When you criticize and put people down, you're speaking death over their life. When you criticize your spouse in the marriage, you're speaking death over your marriage. Literally, you are. And we are called to have living waters, not waters of death, not poison. And so these living waters will be waters of thanksgiving, gratitude, and, and, and lifting up. And the last one, <laughs> this is the really tough one. <laughs> Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, the flesh doesn't want to submit to anyone. The flesh wants to be boss. The flesh wants to be numero uno, number one. I'm the one who calls the shots. And when you see a person who comes in and goes, you know, I'm so happy to submit to authority. I'm so happy to submit to you. I'm so happy to do what you tell me to do. I'm so happy to consider what you want me to do is more important than what I want to do. You know, there's a person filled with the Spirit. Because they don't care about what they have to do. They just want to help others. They just want to be a blessing to others. They want to submit to each other. And when you see a person like that, who's overflowing with thanksgiving, who wants to be submitted, you see a person filled with the Spirit. Because what does the Spirit do? It's subjected to Jesus Christ. The Spirit is not there to talk about Himself. He's not there to glorify Himself. He's there to glorify Jesus Christ. And what does Jesus do? He glorifies the Father. Jesus said... You want to come to the Father? You come through me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. You notice how people like you to talk about God, but they don't want you to talk about Jesus? Because Jesus is the way to the Father. He's the way of salvation. That's why you can talk about God being a God of love, and people will listen to you all day, but you start talking about Jesus dying on a cross, and they want to shut you down. Because the devil knows that Jesus is the way to the Father, and the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus so that the Father will be glorified. And our role is to lead people to Jesus, to point them to the cross, which will point them to the Father. And a, a, a big mistake the church has often made is to, to just talk about God and not talk about Jesus. You know, and we, we're all lovey-dovey, but we're not talking about the importance of the cross. We need the whole gospel. Come on, we need to talk about Jesus and we need to understand that the Holy Spirit in us will always glorify Jesus. It will be submitted to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is always submitted to Jesus. Just as Jesus was submitted to the Father. Remember what Jesus said? I only speak what the Father tells me to speak. I only do what the Father tells me to do. What is that? That's submission. Submission to the authority of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is submission to the authority of Jesus Christ. And so we should be submitted to one another and be thankful and rejoicing in it. And when you see a person like that who's not getting drunk, who's not wasting their time on all kinds of distractions in their life, when you see a person who's singing psalms and songs, their heart plays music to the Lord, they pluck the strings of their heart and out comes thanksgiving and rejoicing and no complaining, and then you see them willing to submit to one, there's a person filled with the Spirit. And you know what? You don't do it on your own. It is not a work of your own. You can't do it on your own because your flesh doesn't want to do this. That's why you need to be filled with the Spirit because it's the Spirit in you that does this. You can never do it on your own and you've tried 20 years to be a more patient person. Maybe you've tried for 20 years to be a more thoughtful person. You can't do it. Your flesh, 
You need to be filled with the Spirit. And so we get down because we can't be who we want to be and we've missed the point and we fill our life with junk instead of going and filling our life with the Spirit who will empower you to do all this. And I don't have, I, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, all of the relationships outlined here because that's a topic of the day about husbands and children and fathers and mothers and slaves and masters. Uh, all of this is really important, but you can read it. You can go through and read the rest of Ephesians chapter 5 and 6, which continues on into the armor of God. And he continues to talk about what being filled with the Spirit is like, having the armor of God put on. It's powerful. Guys, you cannot read this and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you from this and not be transformed. You'll understand, reading Ephesians 5 and 6, what a life looks like filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a life armored with God's armor. It's a life full of thanksgiving. It's a life overflowing with praise. It's a life that is happy to submit to authority and to one another. It's a life that is just filled with living water that is just flowing out of them. And you cannot miss it in a person because you see the Holy Spirit working in them. And you go, wow, that's amazing. You know what it is? It's a person submitted to the working of the Holy Spirit. I want to finish by telling you my experience of this. There has been three or four key times in my life when I've been serving in leadership in another ministry or even in a workplace, in another workplace, and uh, I've been wrongly judged or I've, I've been put down or I've been told that I'm doing the wrong thing when I know that it is a lie, that it is a misunderstanding or it is someone else gossiping about me trying to run me down. And these have been key times in my life because I've wanted to react to that. I've wanted to, you know, get mad and get hurt and get angry. And the Holy Spirit has filled me at that moment and taught me how to honour those people, how to respect those people and to never burn the bridge with that person. And I've seen time and time again God restore relationship when I've determined to honour and not to get angry, determined to honour and to forgive determined to honour and not allow bitterness in my heart. And I tell you guys, the Holy Spirit will give you the... I could never have done it on my own. Never, ever. What was... You know, I, I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to dishonour those people, but what was done was just horrible. Some of the things that were done to our family were just horrible. And yet in that place of determining to honour, determining to respect those people, God restored relationship and brought beauty out of ashes. And He can do that for you too. You see, when we continually are filled with the Holy Spirit, these things just flow out of us. You don't even have to work at it because it's the Holy Spirit bubbling up in you and flowing. A river doesn't have to flow. It just flows. It naturally just flows. And it can cut through the deepest, hardest rock. Given time, a river will cut out the Grand Canyon. Come on, given time, a river will cut out. And it doesn't have to do it by force. It just does it because it is what it is. And the Holy Spirit in you will do what the Holy Spirit will do. You just have to allow Him. You just have to cry out, Holy Spirit, I want to be filled again with you today. And I'm going to finish with last scripture, Acts 13, 52. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you, do you want to be filled with joy? filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you got baptized before, maybe you experienced an infilling of the Holy Spirit, but today you need to be filled afresh. You need to come back to that source of the living... Come on, music team, you can come forward. You want to come to that living source and you want to be filled afresh and you want to have that heart of thanksgiving. You want to have that heart of worship. You want to have that joy in you. You want to have that willingness to submit. You want to have that absolute abundance of the, 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 the filling of every part... Nothing is addicted or filled with any other purpose in your life but Jesus Christ and His glory. He wants to do that today, and He will. But you need to open your heart that it happen. You need to say, Holy Spirit, that's me. I want to be filled today. I want to be filled. I want that joy. I want that thanksgiving. I want that heart of gratefulness, and I'm not afraid anymore. I just want what you want, Holy Spirit. And I want to give you the invitation to come forward 
and just kneel or stand or sit or whatever you want to do, but just make that decision to come forward and as an act of worship, as an act of submission to God's Spirit, come forward and let Him touch you again and feel you again. And He will.